at issue on a special Tuesday edition, the Fall Economic Statement. Our economic plan is focused on building an economy that works for everyone. But in challenging economic times, is it enough to help Canadians? Common sense Conservatives will vote non-confidence on this disgusting scam. So far, we're going to continue to, to work to get Canadians help. So with little new spending, what message should we take from this update? Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton, here to break it all down. Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see you all. Um, I'm going to start with you, I think, Chantal, on, on what, you, what message you're taking from this. And, and of course, I said small spending. I, that is a relative statement. It's small spending compared to things this government has done in the past. But, but what message do you take from the update? So um, I'll hold my breath until Andrew is uh, overjoyed by the smaller <laughs> spending. Uh, but. Uh, meanwhile, I, I'm reading politics into it for obvious reasons. Sure. We're coming to an election. We are in a pre-election setup. And I think the Liberals have realized that they're going to be running against the Conservative Party that claims it's going to balance the books. So basically, uh, they are set to do a number of things. A campaign on this notion that if they were re-elected, because that is in the horizon where they placed it, they would limit deficits to 1% of the GDP, 26, 27. So they'll either be dead or be there. Um, and then probably uh, challenge Pierre Poilier to demonstrate how we would get rid of a $38 uh, billion deficit. And that's the forecast, not mm -hmm. necessarily what would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be higher uh, once the election is on. Does this make it a solid fiscal plan? I am not convinced. But what it also says, there is a downside to this, is that if the Liberals are serious about what they said today and the 1% of GDP in 26, 27, then they have no money to promise anything yeah. because yeah. they've run out of fiscal room. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was what I thought too, Andrew, was if things are this bad, how on earth are they going to table a budget and then campaign on a budget at some point? But first, give me your impressions. <laughs> Well, there's a whole lot of distraction, basically. Uh, you know, they put the housing stuff up front, which is fine, but is really not going to make that much of a difference to housing affordability, to be frank. Uh, it's, it's tinkering around the edges. Uh, there's some stuff in there about competition that's intriguing. We'll see what it means in the end. But all of this is basically to, to divert your eyes from a de deteriorating fiscal position. They managed to keep the deficit this year to $40 billion by suddenly discovering another $5 billion in expected recoveries of overpayments for COVID payments. So we'll see whether those materialize. But out years, the deficit's now going to be another $12 billion more than they projected just seven months ago. $12 billion a year more than they projected seven months ago. Uh, they, they keep announcing guardrails and anchors. So the new one is 1% 1 of GDP for deficits. Uh, but meanwhile, the old guardrail, the one that was supposed to be in place of a constantly declining debt to GDP ratio, uh, they've missed that again. And in fact, it's going to continue to rise for the next two years. So, uh, and the final thing is that the, the, the interest costs now uh, mm -hmm. are way over what they projected again just seven months ago. Next year's interest costs are going to be $52 billion. That's twice what we spend on national defense, which, by the way, we're not increasing. So they're getting uh, uh, hammered by inter increased interest costs. They're giving, getting less and less fiscal room because of it. Uh, but they don't seem to be overly perturbed by that. Althea. Well, if they are, they can't say that they are, right? They have to pretend that they're not. Um, they're, I mean, politically, I think it's interesting. I agree with uh, Andrew on a number of fronts, but I don't want to minimize some of the changes that were announced today because I think those edges needed to be tinkered with when it comes to housing affordability, especially mm -hmm. for the most vulnerable in our uh, country. Um, it is very much a political document. A lot of the spending is actually booked, not for next budget, but the following budget. So one would assume the election budget. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting how some of the measures in the fiscal update are intended to um, steal some of the conservatives' thunder. I think about um, when it comes to labor mobility, for example, that is something that Pierre Polyev has talked about. Now the government says something like it's going to use the provincial transfers to try to uh, push for change in that direction. I thought the uh, carbon um, carbon contracts for difference is very interesting. So this means that basically the government is saying to companies who may not have invested or who already have invested that if the price on um, 
on greenhouse gas emissions drop, that the federal government would be compensating them financially for that. So that ties Pierre Polyev's hands. He has refused to say whether or not he would remove the price on carbon when it comes to large emitters. This makes it actually easier for him to say that he would not. Um, and then the other thing I thought was really interesting was not at all in the fiscal update, but was Jagmeet Singh's response mm -hmm, to the fiscal mm -hmm, update, mm -hmm. where he actually acknowledged that he doesn't expect a costed plan yeah. on pharmacare. And yeah. I'm not sure that New Democrats <laughs> actually realized that that's the leadership's position, yeah. that yeah. all they want is a framework. They don't actually expect a plan. So yeah. lots of really interesting political tidbits coming out today. Um, Chantal, what did you make of some of those those pivots? That I mean, certainly saying now we just want we'll, we'll have some legislation that will be a first step to pharmacare is markedly different than than where they were just a couple of months ago. True enough, but I think uh, Jack Singh had done some uh, preventive uh, medicine on this last week when he said he did not expect Pharmacare yeah. to be yeah. part of the fiscal update. And I, me, I read it as a, uh, we're going to give them a pass. And why would they not? Because uh, there are no grounds here for the NDP to want an election to be fought on. The other problem the NDP has, and we keep going back to it, is if you're going to have a, a pharmacare program the way that NDP members want it, yeah. you need some provincial buy-in. Yeah. I'm still waiting to see that provincial buy-in, and I don't see it. Where, where does this leave the government? And I'll, I'll just get everybody quickly on this, Chantal, politically. Like, if, if it has to go out and sell this to Canadians as people, we're doing things to help Canadians. Where does it leave them? Well, it leaves them alive to fight another day, which is as good as it can get for them at this point. I don't think we will be talking about the fiscal update uh, next week. Andrew. Yeah, it's pretty neutral. It's not really much of a shift to the right or left. That may simply mean that they're kind of frozen in the headlights waiting until the next budget uh, and where they'll make a, more of a significant move, perhaps. But this, this one is not a huge movement in one direction or the other. Is that a good thing, though, for them at this stage? Politically, I, I don't know. I mean, it I think it depends on, you know, if you think you can get back those center center right voters that have fled to the conservatives, if, if you think maybe they're going to get fed up with Paul or whatever, then you'd stick to the to a more fiscally conservative line. If you thought those voters are lost to you and the only thing to do is to try and squeeze down the NDP vote, then you'd move to the left. They haven't really done much of either in this case. Okay, Althea, where do you think it leaves them politically and in, in terms of convincing Canadians they are fiscally responsible and, and have their backs? Well, I think in a way the opposition is doing their job for them because the op like the conservatives are saying you're doing too much, you're spending too much, you're adding inflationary f fuel on the fire and the uh, NDP and the bloc are saying you didn't spend enough. So this is like the perfect position for the liberals to be in. So if I was a liberal in the prime minister's office, I would be thinking this was a win. Um, it's as good as they could have expected. Is that is that fair, Chantel? That 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 they are coming out sort of in the in the middle, and that's the place to be with this. I wouldn't call it a win, but breaking even this <laughs> fall it would be a first for the Liberals. <laughs> when, when, it's it's fine to be in the just in that in that kind of middle when you're at forty or forty five percent in the polls. When you're at twenty five yeah. percent, you may need to think a little bolder. Yeah, and do something that will convince people that to go one way or another. Okay, well, I, in spite of the fact that you don't think we're going to talk about this again next week, we might talk about it again on Thursday. But we'll, we'll, we'll see what we'll see what the rest of the week brings. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back, as I said, for our regular airing of the Ad Issue panel this Thursday. Uh, see you then, if not before. And now I'll send things back to Adrian in Toronto.